All right, successful CEOs. So what does a successful CEO look like? When I ask you that question, what's a picture that comes to mind? Well, let me share a picture that might come to mind to many. Um, this individual graduated from Dartmouth University, magna cum laude, with a degree in mathematics, was a captain of his football team, six foot tall, uh, got an MBA at the wrong school, at Harvard Business School. Um, and then at the age of 45, if I can figure out how to work this, Jeff Immelt looked and had all the pedigree to be selected to run one of America's most iconic and largest companies. So often when we think about what a successful CEO looks like, we picture someone like him. Well, how is this for a picture of a successful CEO? Is that a mistake? Garbage man? So that doesn't often come to mind when you think about a successful CEO. If you think about Don Slager, and we talk about Don in our book. So Don didn't go to college. Uh, Don graduated from a vocational school. Um, none of his, not, nobody in his family went to college either. None of his friends went to college. Um, Don's first six years of his career were spent getting practical experience, meaning hauling trash. Not, probably not the picture that we mostly picture, think about when we picture a successful CEO. Well, what's interesting is if you look at the results, as some of you probably know, uh, Jeff went on to see the uh, General Electric stock be the lowest performing stock in Dow Jones Industrial Average over the course of his career as a CEO. Don Slager, however, went on to lead Republic Waste, so staying in the core industry of trash hauling, and Republic Waste is a much less known Fortune 500 company that Don led to double equity value over the course of his tenure, uh, and it was uh, outperforming the index every year that he was in charge. Our firm, GH Smart, are leadership, we're leadership advisors. What that means is that boards and CEOs call on us and bring us to the table when they're making the most important business decisions around people, decisions that will affect fates and fortunes of their enterprise. Time and again, over 20 years, we found that what looks like a perfect picture, perfect CEO, and what actually, to, people who actually turn out to, do, to deliver results are often not the same thing. So we've done 17,000 executive assessments over 20 years. And then over 10 years ago, we partnered with Steve Kaplan at the University of Chicago, uh, with academics and data miners at SAS Institute, to finally get to the bottom of this. What gets you hired as a CEO, and what actually leads to strong performance? What we found shocked us. So what we intuitively saw in the boardrooms and in the leadership team meetings really screamed at us once we ran the data. When we ran the analysis and we looked at the variables that are associated with who gets hired or what looks like a good, a good CEO candidate and compared it to what actually indicates strong performance, the overlap was minimal. So how is that possible? It's a $112 billion problem. So $112 billion doesn't mean anything to most normal people. So to bring it home, $112 billion is $50,000 given to every college graduate in this country. I'm sure we'd all like that. So $112 billion worth of shareholder value gets eroded in the world every year because we pick the wrong people, because what looks good and who actually delivers result isn't the same thing. But you know what's the bigger problem? The bigger problem is that most of us don't look like Jeff Immelt. Right? Most of us don't look like a picture perfect. And so most of us actually assume that aspiring to the top of the power isn't for us. Right? And so how is it possible that in the day and age when there's so much data available, there's power to the data, power to the analytics, people who actually get to the top of the power pyramid, if you will, in the biggest organizations are still chosen largely by gut feel. For example, what do I mean by that? Well, still in the boardrooms and in management team meetings and in conversations with hiring managers, you'll hear a conversation like, well, gosh, he looks really strong, but you know, I'm really worried because he's an introvert. And we all love to hire charismatic extroverts because we imagine larger than life leaders. Well, when we dig into the data, extroverts have no performance advantage. In fact, when we look at the top performing CEOs, introverts had a slight advantage there. Um, on the flip side, if you happen to have a strong non-Anglo-Saxon accent, pound for pound of the same capability, our data shows you're 12 times less likely to get hired for a CEO job. In the age of diversity, in the age when we're spending billions, the subconscious bias is still out there. 
Needless to say, when we look at the performance, accent had no impact on performance. So what does matter? Well, we didn't actually know when we started to uh, crunch through the data, we didn't know if we will find kind of the CEO genome, if you will. That's universal across company sizes and industries. Um, we did find. What we found is it's not the pedigree, it's not the inborn traits that one has a hard time changing. We found four deceivingly simple behaviors, four really simple behaviors that one can practice at any point in their career. We've frankly seen highly successful CEOs who are still struggling with some of these behaviors and we're helping them develop them. And we've also seen college graduates and even high school students who are demonstrating real mastery in some domains on some of these behaviors. So we found four behaviors that differentiate successful CEOs. What are these behaviors? To make it simple to remember, we came up with this acronym DARE. So D-A-R-E. And we talk about it in the book. So the first one, D, stands for decisiveness. Not surprisingly, CEOs are called on, they're the tip of the spear, making decisions on behalf of the company. What did surprise us, however, we expected that successful CEOs stood out for the quality of their decision making. We thought they had a stronger, they're smarter, they're um, somehow were able to see through, through myriad of data and make the right call every single time. You know what shocked us? When we looked at what differentiated successful CEOs, it wasn't necessarily the quality. It wasn't necessarily the batting average. It was the speed of their decision making. So CEOs like to be the deciders. Um, Mary Barr earlier was talking about being in a crisis and having to make decisions with imperfect information. So we were surprised to find out that it wasn't necessarily the absolute smartest of the CEOs who stood out, but it was those who were willing to take a stand and were willing to make decisions amidst ambiguity. So that's decisiveness. Second one is adaptability. So when we're in the boardroom, this is the one behavior that gets the most play these days. So if there are very few things that we all can agree on uh, in this day and age, but the fact that the pace of change is accelerating is one of them. And so boards want to have adaptable CEOs. So when we think about what makes someone highly adaptable, what do you imagine? Many imagine that somehow they have a better crystal ball. They just know where the future is headed, right? And we all have friends who will tell us, I knew exactly how that was going to come out, right? And so we imagine that maybe to be highly adaptable, you need to have this uncanny ability to predict the future and see through the clouds and know exactly where things are headed. You know what we found? Shockingly, the best adapters are really good at letting go of the past. They're able to let go of the past, of the past behaviors that made them successful, and now that they're in a new role, they need to change those, of the past business strategies that made them a ton of money and need to change. So, you know, Kodak uh, is one example. Kodak had a digital file sharing way before Facebook came about, right? And lots of other, and, and digital photography came about as a mass market. Why didn't they proceed? Because they're making too much money in the regular photography. Um, Blockbuster. Blockbuster had a few opportunities to buy Netflix for like small, low double digits. So it wasn't an ability to see the future. It was not about not knowing where we're going. It's not letting go of the past quickly enough. Now what's interesting though, is that most of us are actually much more adaptable than we, adaptable than we think we are. Um, and we're most adaptable in a crisis. So I, what differentiates successful CEOs is that they're able to adapt not just in a crisis situation, but they're able to sometimes create that burning platform for, that, for their organization and adapt ahead of the curve. Third behavior is one that gave us the most trouble, uh, relentless reliability. How is that a CEO behavior? So everybody wants to be reliable, but that just sounded so simple. Um, here's the shocking thing we found about relentless reliability. Of the four behaviors, that are statistically associated with high performance in CEOs, there's only one that actually had statistical significance to getting hired, and it was reliability. So if you show yourself and if you are a relentlessly reliable leader, you double your chances of getting hired. Isn't that great? So that's pretty good news. Here's even better news. It increases your chances of high performance 15 times. Now here's a little bad, the worst news here. We had 11,000 people of all walks of life, took a self-assessment online with us on these four behaviors. Guess which, which of these four behaviors was the lowest rated behavior? Yes, it was reliability. It is so simple, and it's really, really hard to do. 
So relentless reliability. And by the way, you can, the beauty of all these behaviors is that you can start practicing them in daily habits that are very, very easy. You want to practice relentless reliability? Think about how many times you've been late to a meeting this week. It's very simple. It's not easy. And then the final one that Steve will talk a lot more about is engaging for impact. It turns out that the best leaders may look like they've got this natural charisma, but in fact, they're leading not to be liked. They're leading not for affinity. They're leading for results. And they do it not so much on the power of natural inborn charisma as they do on the strength of daily habits that allow them to engage others around them towards moving the enterprise forward. So with these four behaviors, I hope we can bring the power of analytics to the process of selecting and growing the next generation of our powerful leaders. And Steve will talk more about their research together. All right, with the clicker. Well, thank you, Elena. And uh, as Elena said, I don't know, about 10 years ago, uh, GH Smart uh, approached me and said, you know, we have this great data. We'd like to know more what's in it. And are, are you interested in working on that? And it was like, yes, raise my hand. And I got to work with their data. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to flesh out some of the things Elena said and talk about who becomes a CEO and what makes a CEO successful. And it'll be basically explaining in more detail what Elena just went through. So it's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, there is a huge amount of anecdotal evidence about what makes a great CEO. You can read it every day in the paper or uh, the financial magazines. Uh, but there is very little systematic large sample empirical work because it's really hard to get good data on the characteristics and personalities of these C-level people. And you know, what do we academics know? Not much. I'm going to go through that. Uh, there's not a lot of good work anywhere. So what do I do? I answer these questions. Who becomes a CEO? How are they different from other people? Who gets hired? And what matters for being successful? So the, the GH Smart assessments, uh, I'm not sure Elena you know, explained exactly what they are. I have like almost uh, well, 2,500 of these assessments. They've done more of them over time. And these are like brutal four-hour interviews where they just grill you and grill you and grill you about your career. And when they're done with you, you know, I've had people you know, tell me I felt naked or I felt like it was a, a kind of exam I don't want to talk about. And you, they really get a lot of information about you. And in these assessments, there are 30 variables or characteristics that are graded across all 2,500 people. And that's what we've used in our research to sort of understand how these different positions uh, look. So uh, what's assessed? These are like you know, 30 different things that are assessed. And if you want the slides, I, you know, I'll give you my email at the end. You can uh, ping me for the slides. So there are these 30 ratings. And it turns out a lot of them are correlated. And so what we did was we did a factor analysis. So there's some, uh, I don't know, it's not big data, but it's data analytics. Uh, and you can compress those 30 factors, so there's 30 variables, into four factors. And let me tell you what those factors are. So the first one is general ability. So what that means is some people tend to score high on lots of things. Now, once you control for ability, then there's a second factor, which is really cool. Some people are strong on interpersonal. And interpersonal would be treating people with respect, open to criticism, listening skills, and teamwork. And some people are strong on being aggressive, moving fast, being proactive, holding people accountable. So that's factor two. Call that execution. Factor three is charisma. So some people are very enthusiastic, very persuasive. We call that charisma. And then the fourth factor is strategic creative. So some people are more strategic creative uh, and smart. And these factors come from the ratings that come from the assessments, these grueling four-hour interviews that GH Smart is doing. So turns out when we had this coded, we asked our research assistants to say, 
you know, before they knew any of these factors, you know, what do you think of this person? And what's really cool is where you read the assessments, they're really correlated with the factors. So the one I'll point out there is nice person. People who were nice people were very strong and interpersonal and not so strong on execution. So it's just a way of saying that the, the factors, even though it's a statistical analysis, actually map into what you might feel if you read these assessments. So now, I'm gonna ask you one question and then I'm gonna just tell you stuff. So CEO candidates, are they high on general talent or low? How many of you think high? And how many of you think low? Come on, you all have to vote, you, be awake. Like Daniel Pink, you're falling asleep now, you gotta vote. How many of you think uh, CEOs are high? And how many of you think low? Okay, so it's more high. Execution versus interpersonal. CEO candidates, high on execution? High on interpersonal. This is 50-50. <laughs> Collectively, you have no idea. Excellent, <laughs> okay. Um, charisma versus analytical. How many think they're more charismatic? How many more analytical? Okay, that's more, it was about two thirds charismatic. And strategic creative versus managerial. How many strategic creative? How many managerial? Okay, so strategic creative. You got three right and the fourth one you don't know. So here you go, CEOs, these are candidates, strong on execution, strong on ability. How many of you are CFOs? Good, because you're weak on both of them. Uh, okay, um, the, uh, on uh, the second dimension, CEOs, they're strong on, they're strong on the charisma side and on the creative strategic, and the CFOs, again, are the opposite. So CEOs look different, really different from the CFOs. So now who gets hired? Those were candidates. There's one variable that moves in getting hired, actually two. The people who get hired are the more talented, so that's good, but it's also the people who are more interpersonal. So in any of these positions, if they like you, you are more likely to get hired. So what makes you a candidate isn't necessarily what gets you hired, okay? So, and uh, charisma and creativity uh, don't seem to matter and there's not much difference between candidates and who gets hired. Okay, um, it turns out, I'm gonna go through this, but it turns out we looked at people who were not interviewed to be a CEO who subsequently became CEOs and what did we find? We found exactly the same characteristics were predictive. So execs with more general ability were more likely to become CEOs later in their career, people who had better execution skills, people who were more charismatic, and more creative strategic. So what does this mean? CEOs are different, but they're different on execution, but once you're a candidate, the interpersonal skills actually mattered. And Finally, these characteristics can be measured, and it's something that if you're in an organization where you are trying to figure out who's gonna become a CEO, measuring these characteristics is probably worth doing. Okay, what about outcomes? So here I've got a smaller sample that I looked at, uh, and this was largely private equity executives. Uh, it was a smaller sample, but we had good data on the outcomes. So how did we get the outcomes? We asked the PE firms, we looked at how the companies did. And what's interesting, so this is private equity investors, they only got the CEO right about half the time. And so you would think, right, they're really good at this? Not so much. And this was data, it's probably five or 10 years uh, ago, so the data aren't completely up to date, but you ask private equity investors today, they'll tell you, you know, we still don't get it right all the time. So. What matters more for performance, execution or team interpersonal? How many of you think execution? How many of you think team interpersonal? You're all scared. You are wrong, it is execution. So the things that were correlated with success were efficient, organized, persistent, proactive, uh, also being creative and strategic, the brain power. The skills were very much execution oriented and the interpersonal things were irrelevant. And let me just show you this. Persistent, efficient, 
proactive. If you scored high on these, the likelihood of success was very high. If you scored low, it was not very high. And uh, this is fours here were A's on the execution variables. And the fours were all very successful. If you look at the team interpersonal, uh, you can see that fours in some cases were the least successful and they're all over the place. So the bottom line, what determines success? General talent matters for success. The other thing is execution. And people didn't like this. You know, sometimes people hear this and they don't like the result. Um, that, because sometimes you hear, you, you know, you've got to be a team player, you've got to do all these other things. But, you know, if you think about who are the icons of management over the last 20 years, Jack Welch, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, these are not so agreeable people, they execute. Um, this is a slide I had eight years ago, and Elena already mentioned this. Jeff Immelt was sort of the, the poster child for this more team, interpersonal kind of management style, and uh, we see what happened to him. So uh, does that mean you have to be tough or a jerk? Right, that's what some people say. You're saying I should be a jerk. No, uh, Satya Nadella, uh, what are his leadership principles? Be clear, be energetic, deliver success. Uh, he is not considered a jerk. He was my student once, uh, so that's very good. And I think you, you heard from Mary Barra today. What did she say about, you know, after she became CEO, what was the thing that changed the most? She said she's more impatient. What is impatient? It's about getting things done. So I'm gonna stop there, because I'm out of time, uh, but I have a bunch of other things. I can talk about it in the questions. Go back one slide, so you have my email if you want the slides, where there's a lot there, and thank you very much. Steve, you could go over. <laughs> this been... Thank you both for that. That was, a, uh, that was a lot of fun to watch and to listen to. Um, I guess at the... Um, risk of putting too fine a point on it. The audience here today really isn't at the CEO level. I'm wondering how this applies to them. You want me to start? So you, you can go and then I'll weigh in. First, first of all, you actually don't know if you'll be at the CEO level or not. One of the findings in our analysis is that 70% of CEOs out there didn't know that they wanted to become a CEO until very close to the C-suite. So that would be my first mm -hmm. message is, Practice the behaviors. You never know where you'll be. Um, the second piece we found is that the four behaviors are really aimed to help you achieve results. And so you can lead with those behaviors. You can practice those habits, no matter where you are or where you want to head. And we've seen that improve performance. And I, so I would agree with that completely, that be more efficient, execute on the margin, be a little more impatient, get stuff done. And on the flip side, you know, don't have too many meetings. You also heard that from Mary today. Uh, the second thing that I think you probably work at that's harder, it is true the more charismatic people are more likely to become CEOs. Doesn't necessarily matter once you become a CEO to your performance, but it gets you in the seat. So if you are an introvert and you might be really talented, on the margin, put yourself out there a little bit more, even if it's a little painful, because that will help you get the job, even if it doesn't necessarily help you do better in the job once you get it. Unless, of course, we're involved, in which case you'll be selected purely on data. <laughs> <laughs> so shifting gears a little bit, can you talk about some of, the, some of the friction that you might see in a boardroom when they're going through selection of a CEO around things like how a person appears versus how you think they're actually going to perform in the role? Yeah, it's really tough in the boardroom, right? Because, look, how do we get CEO selection wrong, right? Many of the people in the boardroom have been CEOs. And so the dangerous thing is that they think they know it when they see it, right? right? So you can have the best data available to mankind, but until they've made a painful mistake, often we see them assume that they know it when they see it. Um, so by, by and large, they're still picking with gut feel until and, there's a painful mistake. And I think they, they seem to be picking people they like a little bit more. Yeah, for and sure. And that right. may, or may, not, sure. may or may not be a, Lead to a, right. a good thing. Yeah. Board members are also, they're used to, by the time you get to be a board member, you're used to being right a lot. <laughs> and so what happens often is that, uh, as one of my clients puts it, I'm sometimes wrong but never in doubt. 
right? And so you have people who are so used to being really competent in something. And unfortunately, picking people is picking people and driving and maybe a few other things are what, some of those skills that most of us are actually overconfident about. So we're usually not as good as we think at interviewing and picking people. But what, what you've also seen over time, too, is on the private equity side, I think they have realized they're not perfect at this. And in fact, you know, they make mistakes. And over time, they have put more resources into trying to do this in an analytically correct way. And I know you, know, you guys have helped a bunch of PE firms do that. Yeah. Right. So uh, thinking, too, about the, you know, the, the composition in the boardroom, is there a, a generational shift that you see where you have to maybe sell on the data a little bit harder or um, convince people as to the, um, the, use, the, the, the case for use? Well, we actually find the hedge funds are doing a great job convincing people on our behalf. So when you see Jeff Immelt pushed out by a hedge fund, when you see Microsoft Steve Ballmer pushed out by a hedge fund, it doesn't take a lot of those wake-up calls before boards who are you know, largely very comfortable and feel like they've got a great, very professional process, which is often, unfortunately, check the box, pro box process. We start getting phone calls. So in, in the old days, we used to get calls you know, at the moment of decision, and the uh, board would say, gosh, our CEO is failing. Help us pick the right one. Today, we often get calls by the sitting CEO saying, look, I want to develop a successor. I know that the old approach is just not going to be enough. And I actually don't know who on my team is, has, has what it takes. So help us give us an objective point of view so that we can actually develop the talent. And that's actually, sorry, Marilyn, I think you asked a really good question. I want to add to this, because the, gr the group here actually does have a lot of power. In the old days, the biggest problem we got called to solve was making a mistake and picking people. Today, more often than not, we get called to solve the problem upstream, which is we don't have enough good people to feed the funnel. You guys are often involved in hiring, right, and getting people at the early stages in the organization, mm -hmm. like in your case, right. right, at the very early stage, accepting right. students to Wharton. You have a hand in, in hiring and developing leaders, and so when you know what to look for and which qualities to prioritize, you can help solve the ultimate problem of having great people to choose from. Um, to, to push on that a little bit further, how do you see um, in, in the data, maybe, how do you see uh, or do you see any differences in diversity, male, female, um, so people of So there's a, a very interesting thing in the, in the second paper where if you look at the ratings and you look at these four factors, mm -hmm. men and women are indistinguishable. And we found that. So the, the women score, you know, either, you know, whatever you're doing or your candidates, the men and women are indistinguishable. What's, what's a little bit disturbing or you know it's a, it's a puzzle is once you hold the the factors which we think is a you know quality constant women are less likely to become CEOs so there there seems to be they don't you get know, picked for, as often. they don't get picked as often or or they choose not to be CEOs yeah. more often we don't know but that seems to be in the data so that's the one gender thing that's um, disturbing or you know it's a big question the, the actual abilities seem to be pretty, pretty constant or pretty similar. Yeah, in our analysis as well, what we found is the four behaviors apply to women and men. We are starting to do more research around women leaders specifically, and we are finding that motivations, some of the career choices, there's, there's some, there are some differences there as well. But how they lead, ultimately, and their, the results they achieve, there's no statistical difference. That's terrific. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm moderating a panel um, is, uh, I like you guys to ask each other a question, but you guys have to understand, these guys know each other really well, so I'm not sure how this is gonna go, but if you, is there something that- Oh, I totally would love to ask I, you. I have, and I have a question for her. Oh, good, okay, perfect, good. then let's do it. I was afraid well, it wouldn't so work because you know each other. I would love to know what's the next thing you're most curious about that you're gonna dig into the data for. Oh, good, and that's gonna be my question to you, good. <laughs> so, so there are two things you can do with the data that we haven't done. So first of all, we have some executives where it's not just the CEO candidate, but it's the CEO, CEO, and CFO of the same company. And so what will be kind of interesting to see are their complementarities, like if the CEO is you know, really good on execution and a jerk, is the CFO really nice, and the other way around. So I don't know, but that's a very interesting question. The second one, which everybody asks us, is 
we don't really have any situational controls in our data. So this data is, is, is actually very cool that you get these results without controlling, like is this a growth business or a turnaround or something like that. And so the next thing would be to try to code that up and see how do the characteristics interact with the actual situation. So that's my question for you. What do you think the answer is? To which one? To how how does the, the situation the, does the situation matter and you oh. look for different people in different situations? Absolutely. Yeah. So in our experience, situation does matter. There are very few. So while these behaviors apply across the board, the importance of different behaviors in a different situation really right. varies, right? If you think about what it takes to run a startup, right, versus what it takes to run IBM. There's, there's different prioritization between relentless reliability, for example, and ability to adapt, right? Um, as a firm, actually, when we call down to help support selection of CEOs, the very first thing we do is we try to really understand the situation. So our hypothesis would be there is not, no such thing as an all-weather perfect leader, and that it really is situational. So I'm excited to hear you wanted to dig into that. Mm -hmm. So you'll present that the next time we're together yes. in a year? Okay. That'd be great. You invite us back. All right. Thank you both very much for your time and your insight today. I think we all really um, enjoyed listening to you, and we look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Thank great. you. Thank Thanks you. for having us.